Book of Nahum, it's page 1501. <clears throat> Comes after the prophet Micah, if that helps. Nahum, chapter 1. <clears throat> I'll read from verse 1. It says the oracle, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. He reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means leave the guilty and punished. In whirlwind and storm is his way. And clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him. And the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence. The world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies into darkness. I want us to think just a little bit about this matter of God being in the whirlwind and the storm. He is in the whirlwind and the storm. Nahum comes to speak to Nineveh, a, a place which has been spared God's wrath. The Ninevites had humbled themselves and repented of their wickedness at the preaching of Jonah and God speaking to them reminds them that he is the God of storm and whirlwind. It is all a part of God's way. God's in the storms dear friends. Remember that in these coming days. Perhaps you're going through something of a storm in some way in your own life in these days. Just remember that God is in storm and tempest. It is God's way. One of the best known scriptures is Romans 8 and verse 28 which probably most of us learnt to quote when we were first saved as believers in Christ. It says that <clears throat> God will cause all things to work together for good. for good, for those that love him, who are called according to his purpose. God will cause what? All things, including storm and 
tempest. God has a purpose in everything. And God is sovereign in the affairs of men. And I want us to think just a little bit about that. I want to take uh, four passages for different accounts of storms and just pull out one or two uh, lessons for us. And the first one I want us to think about is Jonah. So if you'd like to turn back a few pages to the prophet Jonah. <clears throat> Because he was God's messenger to the Ninevites. So let's read Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, mm -hmm. found a ship that was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Here was a man who'd been called and instructed and sent by the Lord with a message of repentance to the people of Nineveh warning them of judgment, that they needed to humble themselves and repent, that God was going to destroy Nineveh for its wickedness. And Jonah didn't want to go. He didn't much like the message, didn't much like the Ninevites, and didn't fancy the commission at all. And so, off he went, bought himself, <clears throat> got a cancellation flight, booked a short break to Tarshish. Thought he could hide himself away. Thought he could excuse himself from God's commission, from God's command to go. But he couldn't. And so God had to hurl a great wind and storm upon the sea. And Jonah, the reluctant prophet as we call him, <coughs> had to step forward and tell the sailors, it's my fault. I'm fleeing from the presence of the Lord. I'm in rebellion. I'm being disobedient to the call of God. God gave me a message and told me to go. And I'm not going. And storm and tempest has come upon you. Because of my disobedience. It was such a man that God used in Nineveh. And I believe it will be such a people that God uses in the last days. We've been given a message, haven't we? Go into all the world, preach the gospel, Repentance for forgiveness of sins must be proclaimed to oh. all the nations and then the end will come. And like Jonah, we're rather reluctant to go. We know that 
God's judgment is coming. We know that we're right in the last days. That the day of the Lord is near and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. That it's God's purpose for our lives to warn people of the judgment of God. To tell them that they need to humble themselves. That they need to repent. They need to turn. But we don't want to go. And we find ourselves sometimes in calamities. In storms. In circumstances that we would not choose. Hiding away from the commission, from the command, from the call of God to go and to share the gospel with those around us, hiding away, trying to sleep. And Jonah needed to acknowledge in the midst of the storm that it was his fault. Dear friends, when we look at the mess that our nation is in, when we see the moral collapse, when we see the awful rebellion against the word of God, when we see the lack of life throughout the church in Britain, When we see good being called evil and evil being called good. When we see a departure from the ways of God, perhaps like never before. What's our response? Jonah needed to come to the realization that he was part of the problem. And God took a man who was humble enough, who knew that he'd failed God, who knew that part of the problem was him. But he was willing to cry out to God in his despair. And God, God gave him new life. God took him from the very pit of Sheol, rescued him, miraculously, and delivered him up, had him spit out, <laughs> gave him a second chance, and said what? Go. Mm -hmm. Dear friends, we find ourselves in the middle of a storm, we find ourselves in storm and tempest, maybe we think, what, what's God trying to say to me? I can give you a word from the Lord this morning because God says go go this world's in rebellion to me this world is facing the judgment and wrath which is coming upon it and I want you to go and warn them my judgment is coming my wrath is upon them. Go. And such a man, now humbled, now knowing he's, he's run away, he's failed the Lord, but God in his great mercy has given him another chance to go. Sets out Fear in the worst. Not an ounce of compassion in his heart for those people. Longing to see fire come down from heaven and destroy them all. What a miserable servant he was. And 
God did a most amazing miracle. God spoke to their hearts through him. Because he wasn't going in arrogance. He was going a broken man. A man who knew he'd failed God. Knew he wasn't worthy. So much as to untie the thong of God's sandal. He, he knew he wasn't worthy. But friends, God can take a voice like that. God can take a man like that. And God can use a man in the midst of a storm <clears throat> and raise him up. Turn to Mark chapter 4. Let's look at another of many storms that we see. Mark chapter 4. I read from verse 35. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side. And leaving the multitude, they took him along with them, just as he was in the boat. Other boats were with them. And there arose a fierce gale of wind. The waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And he himself was in the stern, asleep <coughs> on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to them, said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. The wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no Faith. What a rebuke to the disciples. All they had was a simple word from the Lord. Let's go over to the other side. That's it. We're going over there. They get on the boat. Experienced fishermen. And the storm boat <clears throat> blows up from nowhere. A fierce gale. The waves are breaking over the boat. It's filling up. And where's Jesus? He's asleep. And they have to wake him up. Teacher, don't you care about us? There'll be times, dear friends, in these days ahead when we come across stormy, perilous, tempestuous events in our lives. When we think we're going to sink, and the only thing that will matter is whether God has told us to do what we're doing. Are you walking in the will of God? You end up in a storm next week, 
Do you know that you're doing what God wants you to do? That you're going where God tells you to go? That if everything appears to be going wrong and you think you're sinking, you're doing what you're doing at His bidding. And everything's going to be okay. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 and verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Always. Again I'll say, Rejoice. Rejoice. <coughs> Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall garrison, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Simple, isn't it? Just keep rejoicing. Keep praising Him. Be anxious for nothing. Stop worrying. Stop being fearful. Stop worrying about the waves coming over the side of the boat. <clears throat> Stop worrying that there's already 18 inches of water in there swishing about. Because God's told you you're going over to the other side. You're walking. According to his word, you're obeying what he's told you to do, and he's with you. He's with you. Amen? Yes. Let's turn to Acts and chapter 27. Here's another storm. The Apostle Paul, Acts chapter 27, a little bit different in circumstance, let's read from verse 9. When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them and said to the men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be attended with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but of also of our lives. Don't go. Listen to me. I'm walking with God. I've got a witness from God. This is not a good idea. This is not the right way to go. This is not what we should be doing. Listen to the word of the Lord. And what did they do? The centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than he was by anything that Paul said to him. We're listening to the science on this one. We're going with the science. Never mind what God says. We're going with the expert view. And they do. 
and Paul stuck with the consequences of their disobedience to God. Dear friends, all we can do is bring the counsel of God. We can bring the wisdom of God, we can bring the counsel of God, we can share warnings from God, but we cannot make the people around us obey the Lord. Especially in these days. They're thoroughly persuaded that man knows what he's doing, that we've got all the best experts now, we've even got AI. And all you've got to do is Google it, and it'll come up with the right answer for you. So off they go. Let's read on. Verse 21. Well, let's, let's read, sorry, from... <clears throat> let's read from verse 18. The next day, as they were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. I think I'd have been up at the front if I was Paul. What are your experts saying now? As they were casting all the cargo off the end. Off the end. Get, get your experts to help jettison the cargo for you. You say, well that, that's just you. Well it probably is. Yes. <laughs> but it's not totally unbiblical, dear friends. Because Elijah one true prophet. How many false prophets? 850. That's about right. Don't expect much different in these days, dear friends. <coughs> There's no rain. We're under the judgment of God. We've got an Ahab and a Jezebel, haven't we? We're a people who've turned away from the Lord. And we're in great need. And it's one true prophet to about 850 false ones. And what did Elijah do? He called upon the <clears throat> false prophets to call down fire from heaven. Come on, you lot. You've been coming. If you've got the true God, you've got the true revelation, come on. Cry out to you, God. You're praying five times a day. You've been fasting for the last 40 days. Shout a bit louder. It must be in the loo. <laughs> They're trudging round the streets, worshipping their false moon god, because their god needs their support. He's only got two billion followers. They've only got all the oil. <clears throat> They've only got a massive amount of land surrounding a tiny little nation called Israel that the true and living God promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. A 
And these two billion false prophets are calling out five times a day to their false god. And he's not listening. So they have to run around our streets and cause a lot of trouble here. Because he won't help them to destroy a few Jews in a tiny little land in the Middle East. And we need to give him some encouragement. We need to get out on the street and tell them to shout a bit louder because Allah's gone to the toilet. Perhaps they need to take their machetes and start cutting themselves and not other people. And shout a bit louder because he's not listening. Well, let's get back to Acts 27. I don't know how I got onto that one. <laughs> They listened to the wrong people. Dear friends, there's lots of people listening to the wrong counsel. They need to hear the word of the living God. And who's God sent with it? Jonah. He sent Paul. Well, now they're in Uraquilo and they're having to jettison all the ship's tackle. And they're being violently storm tossed. On the third day, verse 19, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. And since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, no small storm was assailing us. From then on, what? All hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. This is not working. Guess what? God's way doesn't work. And we need to start reminding people in this world. Man's way doesn't work. We used to instruct our children in the ways of God. Our schools weren't filled with knives and guns. Filled with Whippin' tops, chalk, balls, hoops. Our children were cutting themselves and taking their own lives. It's not working, is it? whole hope is gradually being abandoned. And when they had gone a long time without food, <clears throat> then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice. <laughs> Can you say that? We need to be able to say that, dear friends. We need to get out with the message now because things are going to go from bad to worse, from worse to worse still. 
And we need to be able to stand up as Paul did and say, you should have listened. I've been trying to warn you for years. Should have listened. Another set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there shall be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you what? All those who are sailing with you. God's done what? He has granted you, Paul, because you have been praying for them, even though they wouldn't listen to you, even though they mocked you, even though they ridiculed you, even though they set out and listened to their experts and they wouldn't listen to you, you kept on praying, you kept on coming to the throne of grace and pouring out your heart and pleading for them and God is now answering and he's given you every single one of them that's a challenge dear friends isn't it when we're living in the midst of a people who are, who are, who are rebelling against the word of God who won't listen to what we say who won't read the word of God. We can offer them the scriptures. We can point them. We can warn them of what's coming in the world. And they won't listen. And the question is, are we still praying for them? Paul never gave up. He kept on pleading before the throne of grace. And God said, I've given you every single one of them that you've prayed for. <clears throat> How big a church would you have if God gave you every single one that you pleaded for? It's a good question, isn't it? Keep up your courage, men, I believe God. <clears throat> It'll turn out exactly as I've been told. What an amazing testimony. A man in touch with God who kept on seeking, kept on pleading for those around him who wouldn't listen to him who rejected his message and ridiculed his religion. One more. Turn to Mark chapter 6. <clears throat> Mark chapter 6. And here's another slightly different storm. Verse 45, Mark chapter 6. And immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida. While he himself was sending the multitude away. And after bidding them farewell, he departed to the mountain to pray. There in the boat, He's told them to go, but he's not with them. He's up on the mountain, but he's told them to go. When it was evening, the boat was in the midst of the sea, and he was alone on the land. 
and seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them. At about the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. And he intended to pass by them. When they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost, and cried out. For they all saw him, and were frightened. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were greatly astonished, for they had not gained insight from the incident of the loaves. Their heart was hardened. Here's a picture of us in these days, isn't it? Our blessed Saviour is up on the mountain. He's exalted at the right hand of the Father, isn't he? Is he praying for us? He's interceding for us. He's watching down on us. He knows everything that we're going through. He knows what's coming in our lives. And he's in control of storm and tempest. He's the God of storm and tempest. And he's told us to go. And we're going. And a storm comes. What are we going to do about it, dear friends? Are we going to call about? <clears throat> are we going to call upon him and trust him? Are we going to keep on entrusting ourselves to the one who is able to keep us? Keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking. They find peace in the midst of the storm because Jesus comes and meets with them. Dear friends, I just want us to encourage I just want to encourage all of us this morning. I believe the Lord wants to remind us that He's in the storms. He's in the difficulties. And He's the one who can give us peace. If we keep trusting Him and keep calling upon Him. Yes, he's, he's our great intercessor at the right hand of the Father, but he's also Emmanuel, isn't he? He's God with us. And he knows when we need him. And he can and will come to us and grants us his peace. The day will come when he gathers us all to himself and when he brings peace, when the Prince of Peace comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, what a day that will be. Yes. And we come with him and we reign with him and we minister with our blessed Saviour and rule this world in righteousness. But in the meantime, dear friends, he's only a call away. He is the Prince of Peace. <coughs> and he can bring peace into our hearts. He can bring peace into the situation that we face 
if we'll trust him and if we'll call upon him. So do it because he's in control of storm and tempest. He's in control of everything. He causes all things to work together for good. There's stormy times ahead for all of us in different ways. But Jesus is the answer. If we keep on trusting him and keep on calling upon him. May God bless his word to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for your word. I don't know if it came up the way that I thought you were pointing us. Lord, I believe you want to encourage us. So Father, would you take your word, minister it to our hearts for the coming days. I do believe we're, we're facing some really stormy tempests mm -hmm. and you're the God of storm and tempest and you're the one who can bring peace and you're the one who can work in incredible ways even in the midst of storms you're the sovereign Lord we're so grateful to belong to you help us Lord to trust you help mm -hmm. us to keep calling upon you Lord in these days we ask in Jesus' name.